Bueno, pues este, es un gusto presentarles a alguien muy conocido para todos, este, Alejandro González. Él pues es viejo conocido del instituto, llegó eh, al instituto, ya no sé exactamente hace cuántos años, pero como estudiante de maestría, hizo su maestría aquí en el Instituto de Radios, en el entonces CRIA. Y después, eh, durante ese tiempo, sacamos al, algún papercito. Este, bueno, más bien hicimos algún trabajo que se quedó por ahí pendiente por culpa mía, creo. Pero demostró que es una persona con un, amplios intereses, etc. Luego, prefirió hacer cosmología y formación de galaxias. Se fue a hacer su tesis doctoral al Instituto de Astronomía con el grupo de Vladimir Escalante. Eh, y digo Vladimir Escalante, Vladimir Ávila, perdón, <ríe> Vladimir Escalante está aquí. En el grupo de Vladimir Ávila y Octavio Valenzuela y todos ellos hicieron eh, pues un trabajo ya más dedicado, de, dirigido hacia la formación de las galaxias, etc. De ahí, eh, poco después, se fue a hacer un postdoc a la Universidad de California en Irving y, eh, y después regresó y como que... Eh, Sí, siguió oscilando mientras hacía su doctorado. De todos modos, logramos sacar eh, un paper haciendo astronomía y luego, digo, haciendo formación estelar y eh, evolución de nubes moleculares. Y después de su postdoc allá en, en Irvine, en, en un grupo que es eh, como un subgrupo del grupo de Phil Hopkins, si, si no entiendo, si entiendo correctamente, ¿no? Eh, mm -hmm. Regresó a, como postdoc aquí a trabajar conmigo y pues hemos continuado trabajando el lado de formación estelar y en particular formación y evolución de cúmulos de manera autoconsistente desde, desde la formación de la nube molecular hasta la formación del cúmulo y su propia evolución. Y bueno, pues más o menos de eso nos va a hablar hoy y pues es un gusto. También nos da muchísimo gusto que eh, pues parece que ya se nos va al centro de física teórica de allá en Chiapas y pues es, así que eh, pues también nos da mucho gusto que, que vaya a, a continuar por el camino de la investigación híbrida de formación estelar a escalas este, extragalácticas e intragalácticas. ¿no? Y pues Alejandro, adelante. Ok, gracias Enrique. Uh, ¿Debo hablar en inglés, en español? ¿Inglés? Este es, si, si quieres mejor en inglés, ¿no? Por, por consistencia, ¿no? Con ok. Okay, so thanks Enrique for the okay. What happens here? Let me uh, oh, wait a minute. I have to share the screen. Mm. Ok. ¿Lo ven? Sí, sí, se ve bien. Sí. Ok. Ok. So, ok. Hi everyone. Today I want to... <clears throat> Wait a minute. Let me... There's something that I cannot close. Ok. Now... Uh, hi everyone, today I want to talk to you about how is the formation and evolution of stellar clusters uh, formed within globally collapsing molecular clouds. Uh, how feedback uh, from massive stars affect uh, the evolution of these clusters. I already showed to you some of our results during the January meeting of the Institute. But that was just a summary, and today I'll present the results we submitted for publication and some work in progress. So let me start by saying that part of my motivation to give this talk uh, were some of the really nice presentations we had the last month this, during the last months. Uh, Probably you remember that Anna McLeod told us about the importance of uh, having observational information on both uh, gas and stars uh, for quantifying feedback from massive stars over 
a large dynamic range. She was more interested, as far as I understood, in extragalactic H2 regions. But she mentioned that they were interested to, uh, to quantify this feedback from massive stars all the way down to cloud mm -hmm. scales. Uh, she said that the expansion of the regions around massive stars uh, is driven mainly by the combination of stellar winds and the pressure of the ionized gas and uh, the direct radiation pressure contributes uh, just a little bit to the expansion of the regions, but not so much. On the other hand, uh, then Patrick Genevel made a discussion about the origin of the initial mass function, what sets the time, the, the peak of the mass function, what determines the power law part of the stellar distribution. And then Pavel Krupa showed his models of embedded clusters, uh, to study the early uh, evolution. Um, in particular, he said that a significant amount of gas had to be uh, dispersed so that, they, so that these embedded clusters could expand within a few mega years to reproduce the sizes of the clusters. I mean, the radii of open and global clusters. He mentioned it, uh, something about multiple stellar populations in clusters and something of runaway stars displaying observed isolated uh, all type stars. So, okay. Okay. Uh -oh. Sorry. Are you there? Yes, yes, we, yes. We, we see everything, yes. Okay, I have a problem. It, it doesn't advance my presentation. Yeah, um, I think you, you can try um, stopping your uh, share screen and, and starting again. Uh, okay. That might work. Me... Uh -uh. Okay. Um, Okay, now it works. Did you see? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, so now we know that most of the stars are uh, formed in clusters. And there are some empirical properties of these clusters that we would like to explain. For example, the mass segregation, the spatial distribution of protostellar objects, uh, the existence of H gradients, or the apparent deficit of OB stars in some infrared dark clouds. And some current results uh, show that most massive stars form in situ at the cluster centers. Um, by comparing observations with numerical simulations, uh, Kuhn and collaborators found that clusters could be formed by mergers. Uh, and other studies uh, have reported the presence of subgroups of different ages in clusters. Um, Javier and his collaborators said that uh, gravitational collapsing model can explain the kinematical properties of young star forming regions. Um, there is evidence of a stellar expansion in clusters. So we would like to have a scenario within which these properties could be explained in a self-consistent form. Um, well, as you know, uh, the turbulence group in the Institute, well, not the turbulence now, uh, the now named physics of the interstellar medium group in the Institute uh, has been working in one model of this type for almost 10 years. It's called uh, the global hierarchical collapse model. Um, here I'm just showing an evolutionary scheme highlighting uh, the main astrophysical processes during 30 mega years, more or less uh, the lifetime of a molecular cloud. First, we have uh, the molecular cloud formation triggered by the compression of gas in the warm neutral medium. 
So then the gene's mass uh, drops by four orders of magnitude. Uh, the global collapse starts along filaments. Uh, within these filaments, there are some small scale collapses which are falling towards the main hub. And so as the cloud collapses, the star formation rate increases. When massive stars appear, its feedback disperses the cloud and regulates the star formation. Let me anticipate uh, that our, numer our numerical simulations cover all these 30 mega years. Uh, I mean, our initial setup starts with the collision in the warm neutral medium, but as I'm interested in the stellar clusters, um, I will focus my analysis in, since the moment of the formation of the first stars until these late times at the end of the DC scheme. Well, this scenario has been, uh, uh, has been tested uh, and with different codes uh, that includes different physics. Uh, one, of, one example is this uh, work of Manuel. He uses this adaptive measure finding code named FLASH. Uh, that includes all these physics and with this really nice resolution, 0.03 parsecs, to, in this work, they uh, propose this gravitational feedback uh, mechanism for explaining uh, the dispersion, the dispersal of John stellar clusters, as the one that I, I'm showing here in the right figure, that is Landa Ori in the Orion complex. Uh, for our simulations, we use the code ART. It's an adaptive measure finding code. Uh, here we are including ionizing feedback from massive stars with, uh, let's say, uh, a simple uh, reality transfer implementation. The initial setup is that of converging inflows that collide and promote the accumulation of dense gas at the interface, which eventually will collapse. And eventually, uh, an important characteristic of our simulations is the star formation algorithm. That is, um, when in a given cell, the gas density uh, reaches a density threshold, uh, a stellar particle can be created with a probability P, but there is, uh, one minus p probability of not creating a stellar particle even when the cell reaches that density threshold. So if that's the case, uh, that cell has to wait until the next time step to create a star. So the longer it takes uh, to form a stellar particle in a collapsing site, the more massive the particle will be. Uh, oh, uh, here it goes again. Okay, so our star formation prescription is such that stellar particles in our simulations are formed with masses of individual stars, uh, populating the mass function at the relevant scales to implement a prescription of, for feedback from massive stars. So that's our main goal to to produce these simulations with this implementation of feedback with massive stars that are formed in the right size in a cell consistent form with the within the molecular cloud. So uh, having said that, we have a simulation of a numerical bot with uh, 256 parsecs per side. Uh, reaching a maximum spatial density of 0.06 parsecs. Uh, the smaller particle with the minimum mass has uh, more or less 0.4 solar masses. The stellar particles, I have to say that stellar particles in this simulation are not zinc particles. I mean, they don't accrete uh, once they have been formed. Um, well, we use this simulation to study the impact of the cloud structure and the feedback on the assembly and evolution of the stellar clusters. So uh, 
in this animation, the color code represents the gas density, and each dot uh, represents a stellar particle. As you can see, uh, three different stellar groups were formed in the numerical box. Uh, today, I will present our analysis of two of them. Uh, the one at the top left, uh, it's, it's the group that we call it uh, group two or G2. And the larger one, which is at the bottom right, uh, I will use some of the analysis to compare with observation. So, okay, okay. Okay. So, okay, let me start by showing you uh, how is the early assembly of the smaller group, the group two. These four panels are projections uh, in the it's white plane. Um, okay, uh, the it's white plane of the stars in the group two. Uh, each a small symbol represents a star, and each panel is a projection of uh, at a different time. At the top left, almost two mega years after the onset of the star formation, two small groups appear. One mega year later, in the top right panel. They are closer. Other mega years later, in the bottom left, uh, uh, they have merged. And then, after two mega years, in the bottom right, uh, the cluster, the group two, has grown significantly. And some of their subgroups uh, appear in the neighborhood of these uh, growing group. So, we found here that stellar clusters formed by mergers. Massive stars uh, are located in the center. Uh, we find different age of structures within the, within the stellar cluster. Uh, okay. Uh, here it goes. Uh, to see this more clearly, uh, I'm showing here how is the star cluster assembly of this group over 10 mega years. Here, the time up zero in the y axis in the x axis represents the moment when the mm -hmm. first stars appear uh, in the simulation in the group. In the y axis, is plotted the 3D distance from the center of mass of the group two. Uh, the group two, you can identify the group two by the uh, dark blue dots. Each dot in this figure, it's a par, it's a star. So the four panels in the last slide are the projections of four moments in the first five mega years of this plot. So the measure we saw in the projections is represented here by the mixing between the dark blue dots and the light blue uh, dots, more or less like at t equals 2.5, 2.5. So at late times, we see a mixing of stars uh, formed in different subgroups and at different times. So in that sense, that's what we are saying, that different issue structures within stellar clusters are found in these uh, simulations. OK, so now uh, we found that the star formation increases over time. This is plotted in the left figure. Uh, it the star formation increases with time until it reaches a maximum, more or less at time 23.5. And after that, it starts uh, to decrease. So uh, in the right panel, uh, but massive stars don't appear until the accretion rate uh, it's quite large. That is more or less at this moment when the star formation rate uh, reaches it, its maximum. So we can see that in the right panel where I am plotting the cumulative uh, mass distribution. Uh, each color line represents the distribution at, at different times. Well, the green and the red are at the same time. Before, uh, before these small groups were merged, 
before this small group merged, as we can see in the left panel, um, in the previous slides when these two groups were separated uh, structures. And they were, as you can see, uh, in each in the green and the red uh, distributions, they didn't reach until the high mass end uh, in the mass distribution figure. So they were formed by low mass stars at that moment. And as time goes on, for example, if you see the gray line, more or less uh, four or five mega years after the onset of the star formation, now we found uh, a star with almost 30 solar masses in the in the clusters. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, in that sense, uh, massive star formation is delayed in in our simulation. So um, following with this, uh, we plotted the stellar age histograms at different times. They started with really narrow distributions. And as times increases, the that are in the that are, times goes on towards the right. And as time as time increases, the distribution is getting wider, and the peak moves towards older ages. Uh, some of these distributions are quite similar to age histograms of embedded clusters. So now we decided uh, to see if the age distribution of the clusters in our simulations are similar to the observed ones. For this, uh, we took advantage of this uh, outstanding work of Marina Conkel in her 2018 paper. Uh, there, uh, she studied the Orion complex and she characterized uh, the general properties of five different star forming regions, Orion A, B, C, D, and Lambda Ori. We chose uh, Orion D uh, to compare it with uh, the, largest, the largest cluster in our simulation. To do that, we give our data to Marina to post-processing the outputs in the same way she processed the observations. So at the end, she gave us ashes and masses for our stellar particles. So we, we will compare this Orion D region with our largest uh, star forming region in the, our numerical box, that is this one that is in the, in the bottom part of this animation, simple animation. Uh, you can see the red group there is the group two that we already discussed in the previous slides. So we found, so the, we did this, um, we found uh, that in red here, I'm plotting the age histogram for Orion D and for the simulations. In red, we have the age histogram for Orion D. In green, the simulated cluster with the ages as we take it from the outputs. In gray, the corresponding histogram for the post-processed data that Marina gave us. And as you can see, the histogram for the original data, the green one, uh, reproduces uh, the peak of the Orion D histogram, but not the tape not a tail at the older ages. Uh, on the contrary, the post-processed data uh, reproduces the tail, but the peak, uh, you know, not so well. Uh, anyway, uh, it was not our original intention to have a perfect model of Ryan D. However, the age histogram uh, of this simulated cluster compares really good with Orion D. I think so. Uh, now, here we have the stellar age, stellar mass distribution. Uh, the colored regions represents Orion D data. The bluer the color, the higher the number of the stars that have ages and masses corresponding to that area. The black contours are for the simulated cluster. 
And in general, they compare good, but well, this is work in progress. Uh, so final results about this comparison will come later. So stay tuned for that. Uh, now I'm coming back to the group, uh, to the group two, the smaller group in our numerical box, uh, just to see how feedback uh, from massive stars affects the evolution of sterile clusters. To do that, uh, we compare our fiducial simulation that includes feedback, the, the one in the right, with a control simulation run with exactly the same initial setup, but without feedback. Um, let me put it again. And as you can see at the beginning, this gas and stellar distribution is pretty much the same, but as time goes on, the, they are really, really different. Uh, to see this more clearly, it's better to plot some snapshots to see the differences. So as you can see at the beginning, uh, see the top panels, both stellar and gas distributions looks quite similar in the two simulations, the one without feedback in the left panels and the, the one with feedback in the right panel. Uh, but then because of the feedback in the right panels, we see that the cloud is almost destroyed uh, by dispersing the gas around the cluster. And at the end, in the bottom right panel, uh, the cluster itself is being dispersed. Uh, on the contrary, in the simulation without feedback, a creation of gas is happening at higher rates. And you still can see the filament in the later stages and in the last snapshot showing here uh, you still can see the filament um, the stellar cluster is are tightly concentrated uh, contrary to what we see and in the cluster in the right that it's really dispersed so now here we can see how stellar feedback affects this partial distribution of the stars within clusters, uh, promoting the mixing of different groups. You can see that in the right panel where different subgroups were formed uh, at different distances from the main group two, the one with the represented by the dark blue dots. But after let's say uh, T equals A, nine and 10, there are uh, a mix of the stellar populations of these subgroups. Uh, that, that's not the case in the non feedback run. Most of the clusters are clearly uh, separated one from each other. And as I mentioned before, these subgroups are tightly concentrated. So in that sense, the mix, it's not happening there. Uh, one important thing to note here is that most of the groups appear in the uh, of the groups appear in both simulations in the one that in, that has feedback and the one that without feedback uh, with exception of this green group in the right figure the one represented by the green dots uh, it only appears in the simulation with feedback uh, it is an example of triggered star formation happening uh, in the outskirts of the main group and um, at that late times mm -hmm. when gas is being dispersed by feedback. So we found an example of trigger type formation, but it's not the rule in our simulations. It's more like an exception. So, but we can see here that the stellar feedback affects how the stars are uh, separated in our clusters. So now here I wanted to show how the gas is affected by the feedback. I'm plotting here uh, the mass in this gas measured in the left figure, measured up to a certain radii, up to 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and 20 parsecs. 
These 20 parsecs representing the whole star forming region around the group two. In solid lines, uh, the results for the simulations with feedback. In dotted lines, the non-feedback results. And as we can see uh, at early times, when massive stars are not formed yet, uh, the mass the mass in gas dense is practically the same in both simulations. But uh, once massive stars appear, more or less at t equals four, four five, uh, feedback started sweeping the gas out of the inner regions. Uh, the outer regions feel that of effect at, at later times. So we found that dense gas is dispersed at more or less 11 kilometers per second, which is consistent with some observational inferences uh, as given by Kim et al. in 2018 uh, and in this other war of 2020. In the right figures, I am plotting the next flux of dense gas. Uh, just Negative values means that accretion is more important in the star forming region than the dispersion of gas. So um, positive values, it means that dispersion is gaining. So what we see in the top figure in the right, uh, that is the, for the simulation with feedback, is that from T0 up to more or less phi, uh, accretion is happening all the time uh, in the next flux is uh, inwards towards the towards the group. Uh, so, but then there is a shift in that behavior because of feedback uh, from massive stars. Once the a massive star is formed, then it starts to ionize the gas, and so it, the dispersion of gas started. So that is. Uh, we can see that clearly in this plot. Uh, the opposite occurs in the simulation without feedback in the bottom figure. You can see that here all the values are negative. So in the whole 10 mega years, this simulation without feedback is accreting all the time dense gas. So it, the behavior is just opposite to what we see in the simulation with feedback. So now, okay, what about the star formation rate? So, uh, well, again, here the solid lines represent the simulation without feedback, with feedback, per, sorry, and the dashed without feedback. And as I showed it before, the star formation rate increases with time. If you take a look at the solid lines, uh, it reaches at maximum at more or less five to six mega years, and then it starts to decrease. Uh, so that happens when gas is being dispersed. In that sense, uh, feedback is regulating uh, the star formation rate. Uh, on the contrary, the uh, star formation rate in the simulation without feedback is intermittent, but we can see a trend uh, of increasing all the time. Uh, what else? What about the stellar mass assembly, the figure in the right? Uh, here in the y-axis is plotted the total mass in stars within the given radius. But let's compare just the final values uh, for the great curves, representing the whole star forming region around the group two. The total mass in stars in the not mm -hmm. feedback simulation is just a little bit more than two times the mass in the fiducial simulations that include feedback. It was a little bit surprising to see that feedback regulates the star formation rate, but at the same time, the final mass in stars in the group, it's not so different from the simulation without feedback. Well, two times is the difference between the two simulations. Uh, well, uh, okay. Let me now uh, say something about uh, the star formation efficiencies. Uh, in the 
left figure, I'm plotting the star formation efficiency in this, in the form that is for is shown in the equation within the figure. For computing this, we only need to measure the mass in the stars and the, and the mass in gas. Uh, so in that sense is the instantaneous star formation efficiency. At a given time, we measure that quantities, we take the ratio and that's the star formation efficiency. We did that for, the, for our simulations. Uh, what we see is that uh, the molecular cloud is destroyed when only more or less 10% has been, most 10% of the gas has been used in forming stars. Uh, but there, if you go to the literature, there are, you can find different ways to quantify uh, star formation efficiencies. Uh, for example, in the right panel, you can see that in this equation, we compute the star formation efficiency, but considering the maximum amount of gas the region has had in the past. Uh, this sounds more like physical, motivated, in that sense that you have a complete reservoir of gas that you can use to, to form stars in the future. So, but obviously this is not uh, so useful for observational point of view, since we can infer easily from observation what was the maximum amount of gas that some region has have had in the past. But anyway, I'm just this is work in progress. I'm just trying to compare how these different star formation efficiencies are in our simulations. And you can go further. And now you have another definition for star formation efficiency. This is a star formation efficiency per free fall time. To compute that, you just have to compute the star formation rate and multiply that by the dynamical time. And, divide, and you have to divide that by the mass in gas. That gives you the star formation efficiency per free fall time. And um, well, in, independently of the definition we use, uh, we found that star formation efficiencies in our simulations are quite low, uh, which is good because it, it comp that's what we expect for from some uh, observational inferences. But what is interesting here is that star formation efficiencies are quite low, even in the absence of significant feedback. If you take a look at the mm -hmm. dotted lines that represent the measurement for the simulation without feedback, the efficiencies are really low. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, that means that maybe uh, if we take a look at the first definition, that could imply that uh, the, the region is a greater and faster, the rate at, uh, yeah, the, the accretion is faster than the star formation process in the region. So the region is getting, gathering so much mass uh, at a rate that the star formation rate cannot process. Uh, process. So this is work in progress. Uh, uh, and well, that's all about star formation efficiencies. Um, I think it was a little bit fast. Uh, I'm concluding here. We presented numerical simulations of the stellar clusters formed within collapsing molecular clouds. I showed that under this scenario, the collapse is hierarchical because it consists of a small scale collapses within the larger scale ones. And the small scale collapses consist of clouds that are embedded in the filaments and falling onto the large scale centers. This process leads to a structure in which each unit is formed of a smaller scale subunits that approach each other and fusions are evident. Massive stars only form once the local star formation rate is large enough to sample the IMF up to high masses. So in our simulations, massive stars tend to appear late in the evolution of the molecular cloud and mainly in the central massive clone. 
uh, the imprint of cloud structure creates radial mass and edge gradients and characteristic edge mass to these distributions, similar to what we see in our IND. Uh, with respect to the effect of the role of feedback shaping this the evolution of these stellar clusters, we found that the net effect of feedback on the star formation rate is to quench it, although we found an example of triggering. Feedback from ionizing stars destroys the molecular clouds. This is quality, qualitatively consistent with observations of gas dispersals, dispersal around clusters. The stellar feedback dispersed dense gas and goods filamentary supply when only 10% has, has been used in forming stars. Um, finally, this is interesting. The star formation efficiencies are quite low. It, this is consistent with observations, which, which is, is good. But indeed, that's the case even in the absence of significant feedback, which means that the star forming region accretes faster, faster than it can convert gas into stars. Um, that's it. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you, um, Alejandro. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, I, I see that Roberto has a question already. So, uh, uh, yeah, please, Roberto. Hi, Alejandro. Hi. Uh, uh, two related questions. So, so it, it seems to me a little bit contradictory that so so you have so you have that feedback. Yeah. Uh, only changes slightly within a factor of two the star formation efficiency per threefold time, but at the same time, it regulates overall star formation because it it's what sets your global star formation efficiency to ten percent. No? So, so my question is, can you reconcile this if you take into account that you are making this measurement at at a time where the star formation efficiency of the non-feedback simulation is still before it it goes runaway, or the question is, does it goes do, do, does it go runaway, um, such that if you measure it at, at a later time, the simulation with feedback will not increase the global star formation rate because efficiency because it blew away all the gas, whereas the one with Without the feedback, the global star formation uh, efficiency continues growing and growing and growing uh, over time. Yeah, here to compute the star formation efficiency, we had two different quantities here. So, on one side, as you said, you have the star formation rate that converts gas into stars. So that goes towards these mass in the stars that are in all the definitions. Yeah. But the other term is the mass in gas. So, uh, so when you uh, disperse gas, you automatically are just uh, shifting these efficiencies towards different values. It doesn't matter if it is uh, the simulation. In, in the case, that's the case in the simulation with feedback, where you uh, sweep the gas out of the region, and in that case, you expect higher star formation efficiencies. Uh, and we see that here. In the inner regions, we see that the blue line here, I'm showing here, the star formation efficiency is almost 50%, uh, 10, meg uh, 10 mega years after the set of star formation. So, but that's, I think that the thing is that we are, there are two quantities here that don't, those didn't, don't go in the same direction because, because of the effect, the effect of feedback, you are sweeping the gas out. Um, and maybe so, that's- So you are not taking into account the gas that leaves the domain? No in the definition of efficiency in the case with feedback is not taken into account? No, I'm taking into account only the mass in gas that <clears> is <throat> within that certain region. Can I comment on that? Th that's why I raised my hand. 
Uh, well, I, I just wanted to ask if later, if, if there is time, if you can give also details on the prescription of feedback, because uh, probably that is, but, but is, is, is that's like another question, so maybe, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, Vicente, what? Uh, <laughs> I can explain a little bit about the, the implementation of feedback. So when, when uh, basically what we do is to compute when we, find, we have a, a massive star. We compute uh, the strong room radius. And in that region, we set the temperature up to 10 to the four. So for a given time, how much time? It depends on the mass of the star. For stars more massive than eight solar masses, uh, it corresponds to the lifetime of these massive stars according to, to certain tables given in the literature. So basically that, that's how it works, the implementation of feedback here. Okay. So we heated the region around the massive stars for a given time. So, so maybe it's a little bit overestimated then, no? The, so, uh, because if you, if you allow for directionality, like uh, if you make like the proper ray tracing of the ionization in, the simulations, in, in simulations with enough resolution, so you will have these accretion flows that are uh, directional dependent. Okay. Regardless of whether in the simulation you form a disc or filament that, that accrete to the protostar. So, so, so uh, th this will permit the protostar to continue accreting and then ionization will only go to some directions, not to the four pi star radian directions. And maybe, okay. and, and maybe you will- But this is done, to... this is done. We only have a, si a simplified description of the, of the radiative transfer, but it is a form of radiative transfer in the form, in the sense that- Yeah, but, but, it's not, but it's not in these simulations. No, I mean, I, no it is, it is, no, it is. It is, that's what I'm saying. It, it, what we do is we take the distance between the separation between the star and the point that you're wanting, and then we compute the, uh, the typical, the mean density, the mean geometric density between the two, and then we decide whether uh, that point should be heated. So, the, so it's, a, it's a strong green sphere, a sphere that changes radii depending in, on, on- In each on direction, angle. exactly, exactly. Okay. So it's not uh, uniform. Okay. Okay. It's not a perfect uh, strong green sphere. So it's just simplified, but it's but it is directional in some sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, uh, I, I was going to give Enrique the, the word, but I think you already said. What you no, said. but that well, that's not what I was going to say. I was going to comment on the star formation. See, uh, uh, this is to clarify a little bit what Alejandro said, but it's very interesting. Uh, I mean, this, we didn't expect this. Uh, we we only understood this in this paper. Is that What's very important, and people often do not take into account, is the accretion onto the region, onto the star forming region. So, and, and that is what can lead to a low star formation efficiency. I, I wonder, Alejandro, if you can show the next, uh, that one. Mm -hmm. This is the standard efficiency per free fall time as Kromholz and collaborators define it, right? And what's, what's interesting is that the efficiency per free fall time is not very high even in the simulations without feedback and that's extremely surprising how can that happen and what happens is that uh, that's what we explained in the 2019 paper what happens is that because of the accretion to the region you keep feeding so in the cases without feedback you keep feeding material into the region and you keep making it denser. So when you divide by the free fall time, you're taking a smaller and smaller uh, a, a free fall time. Uh -huh. So when you, uh, when you solve for the, for the efficiency per free fall time, uh -huh, you get small values of the free fall time and that gives you a small, small values of the efficiency per free fall time. And that is just because you have a lot of material that ca has continued to accrete onto the region, right? So it, what happens is people don't take into account the accretion onto the star forming region. When you do, you see that the mass increases, the density increases, and therefore the free fall time decreases. 
Now, if you can show the previous transparency, please, Alejandro. That goes the same way for the two star formation efficiencies, instantaneous star formation efficiencies. Uh, for example, on the left, you see that you're dividing by the instantaneous mass of gas. That's what, how people normally measure the star formation efficiency. They measure the, the number of stars and they divide by the total mass, mass of gas plus, number, plus mass of stars. But if, and, and so that uh, is not very large because in the case without feedback, the mass of gas keeps increasing. In the case with feedback, both the mass of gas and the mass of stars saturate. But in both cases, it doesn't go so high. It, of course, in the, uh, it can go high at the very central parts. For example, if you look at the blue lines, blue solid line uh, in the left figure, uh, it goes to about 50%, but that's within a radius of two parsecs. So that's normal for massive star forming clumps. So, but the, what's interesting is that what is often neglected is the that the mass of the region is, is changing in time as well. So in the case without feedback, it keeps increasing by accretion to the region. In the case with feedback, it, it's blown away. And in both cases, you end up with a value of the star formation efficiency that is not too large. And that was a surprise. We didn't, we didn't uh, expect this. We only realized that in this paper. Um, okay, thanks. Um, Rene, do you have a question? Um, or yes, what? yes, I do. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Alejandro, yeah. uh, I, I think I missed this from your talk, but do you assume uh, an IMF in the beginning of your simulation, or can you measure it or calculate it from the results? No, uh, no, we don't assume, but our the star formation prescription uh, gives you naturally uh, this star, or this uh, mass function that is similar to Salpeter one. It's not a result, it's consistent. Our star formation prescription choose a probability that is consistent with that Salpeter uh, mass function. But, but that, is, that, that is something you assume from the beginning then? Yeah, it depends on the probability we choose here, and we get that, but it's not, uh, I mean, it's not a, a result. It's something yeah. that we, we choose the probability to get that. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, I think next is uh, Roberto Terlevich. Um, uh, hi, good afternoon. Hi. The very interesting piece of work. Uh, I was wondering about the the velocity of the gas, remnant gas, uh, in the models with feedback. I think yeah. that uh, you mentioned 10 kilometers per second, the expansion yeah. velocity. Yeah. So that's about the, the sound speed of the gas, the ionized gas. And uh, I was wondering, th these are relatively small clusters. Uh, what yeah. happens if the escape velocity from the cluster is several times larger than the 10 kilometers per second? What happened in that condition? Uh, can you repeat again? Say again? What, well, what happens is the, you the, the escape velocity? You mentioned that the, the, the expansion velocity of the, of the gas, yeah. the Brennan gas, is about 10 kilometers per second. Is that correct? Yeah. So, if you have larger clusters, the escape velocity from the cluster, okay, more massive clusters, the escape velocity could be larger than that's those 10 kilometers per second. So, the gas might not leave the system. That's a speculation, perhaps. And uh, so, it could be that when you go to more massive clusters, that changes the evolution of your models? Uh, yeah, probably you are, if the gas cannot escape from the region, and uh, you have enough material around the cluster, maybe you are just collecting and collapsing uh, this, uh, this gas. So maybe uh, new triggering, 
star forming regions will appear there. Um, other you, have, you, haven't, you that. haven't not included uh, in your models uh, systems with larger masses. No, no, uh, we don't have simulated, uh, we haven't simulated that kind of systems. Pardon? Yeah, we haven't simulated that kind of systems. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the simulations only form these uh, smaller, these are small clusters. So we don't have these huge structures of gas and stars. Okay. So it's just a point that uh, yeah. in systems in which escape velocity is larger than the typical velocity, expansion velocity of the gas, it might be a, 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 a qualitative difference in the evolution. Can I comment on that? Yeah, uh, if nobody says no, <laughs> I, I, I can. I, yeah. So uh, actually, uh, you're right, Roberto. It, it's very interesting. And first of all, we have to say we only have photoionizing radiation uh, in in this uh, as as feedback source here. So uh, if perhaps we we included uh, uh, radiation pressure and supernova explosions and winds. Uh, we could deal with more massive clusters. Indeed, our clusters are not very massive. But the other thing is that I'm always worried about this way of thinking just in terms of, of, uh, of the escape speed from the cluster or from the clump, because this is a gas. And so even, so th there can be a sort of uh, runaway situation where if you increase the, the pressure inside the clump, mm -hmm then it might expand a little bit, but then that reduces the, the potential well, and then it can expand more, right? So I, I've, I, I always see this discussion in terms of the escape speed from the cluster, but that neglects the fact that you can uh, puff it up a little bit, you know, uh, make it a little bit, make the cloud a little bigger because the cloud, the gas is providing much of the gravitational potential. So when you inject heat into it, you can puff it up a little bit. And then when you puff it up, then you decrease the gravitational potential and then you can puff it up a little bit more. I think it's more complicated than just thinking in terms of the escape speed, although I understand that everybody does that. Maybe, maybe that should be something we should test at some point, but I just wanted to make that point because I see the, the discussion made in terms of the escape speed very often. And, and I think it's a little bit of an oversimplification for what happens with the gas. That, that's just my, a comment also. Oh, oh, oh indeed, you're, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. it, 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 just, it just surprised me mm -hmm. that the expansion velocity was the, of the Renan gas was so low. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then uh, so similar to the, to the uh, sound speed of the ionized gas. And, uh, but one thing that it is known is that at least for this type of clusters, that, that's more or less the typical escape speed of the dense gas. You know, the, the few people that have measured it, um, I think Divacara at some point measured it. Uh, uh, I always quote that paper from Divacara uh, uh, giving the expansion of the gas. There's also a paper by Lysowitz in, in the late, late 80s where they measured the, the recession velocity of the dense gas away from the from the clusters, and that is of the order of the sound speed of the of the warm gas. So I think it's consistent with what's measured in clusters of this mass. But of course, when you have super clusters, it's a whole a completely different story. Thank you. Very nice work. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, uh, I think Javier has a question. Um, very nice work. Uh, I was wondering, um, I distracted a little bit, you were comparing uh, your simulations with uh, Orion D uh, region, is that right? Yeah. So, yeah. and uh, I got the feeling that it was only about stellar ages. Did you say something else about the physics of the region, uh, how massive it is, how many stars there are, how big yeah, it is? Yeah, in Orion D, uh, uh, Marina reports um, more or less like 
200 stars, 2,000 stars, with a total mass of around 1,700 solar masses. Uh, in our simulation, in these uh, clusters, we have like 1,400 1, solar masses with only about 1,000 star particles. Uh, that's more or less the, the amount of stellar mass in, in both in the Orion D. And, and what is the meaning of this plot? Sorry. Say again. What is the meaning of this plot? Uh, just to compare in. Uh, the, I don't see the, the x-axis. I don't know why. Uh, uh, ages. The age okay. of the stars. Okay. Okay. And in terms of sizes, have you an idea? Uh, uh, of the whole region? Of the of the Orion D region compared to, to the simulation that to the part of the simulation that you are taking into account? Uh, it's more or less like twenty par twenty to thirty parsecs. Uh-huh. Yeah. And in both cases? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Mm. Okay, um, I see I see some people, oh, uh, Jesus, Jesus Tola. Yeah. yeah, I wanna still go back into the comparison with Orion. Uh, okay. Are there, how are the, the ages from the observations computed? I guess they do photometry and they, they compare with a certain model of the synthesis population. Do they include binaries? Does this because I think binaries or single models will differ at some point with the time estimate. So, how happy are you comparing your simulations where you cannot resolve binaries with a cluster that I have no idea if it has binaries, for example? Yeah, you're right. Uh, it's complicated to include binaries in our simulations. We don't have that a prescription for that. So in that sense, it's just a step forward in the future, but we haven't that. Uh, in, this, in the observations, uh, I have to say that I'm not really sure how these properties, ages and masses are computed. The Marina performed two different uh, ways to compute that uh, from one set of uh, stars where they have uh, the spectral for the stars, they use uh, 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 HR diagrams, and then they have a different method using um, color, man color magnitude diagrams. Um, but more or less, that what I, that's what I know about that. Uh, I haven't taken a look in detail to the, what Marina did. So what do you mean with uh, synthetic? Uh, age histograms from your simulation. What do you do? Okay, I maybe it's uh, it's so much. I mean, I give the data to Marina, so they post process the data in the same way as she did for the uh, observation. She added uh, to the estimations a typical Gaia magnitude dependent uncertainties in the flux. So sources fainter than the typical detection of the limits were discarded. Yeah, so, um, so at least the processing of the data and the simulation is the same, so she, she did it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, Thanks. basically we, we gave her masses and ages from the simulation. She took them and added the uncertainties that typically occur for the observational data and then, re, uh, and then created fluxes uh, from, the, from the stars, from the simulated stars, so that she could place them in, the, in, an, H star di in an HR diagram or something like that. And our the color stars, magnitude diagram. In the yes. color magnitude diagram. And then and from then, there, infer again, yeah. ages yeah. and masses. Okay. Yeah, my point is that at least that is the same, but whenever they computed the age of this Orion D cluster, they should have uh, assumed or adopted certain uh, models of synthesis population model, binaries yes. or non binaries, a percentage of binaries which you do not include. That's oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I don't know if I can comment on that. Uh, uh, so I, I, I'm not sure what you mean by uh, Jesus by, by synthesis uh, population methods. It's not like what you do in a star galactic thing. 
what the, what the marina usually does is they plot all the stars in the, each, the, the uh, in the color magnitude diagram, and then you have isochrons from models of the of, of early stellar evolution, and then you take you take cuts. You say, well, something that is younger than this age, or or between these two ages, or something like that. And uh, and of course, if uh, if there is a binary shift in the the total luminosity, then of course you, uh, there will be some some uncertainty. Do you have any idea if these clusters are as binaries or yeah, the total? Sure. Ah. Sure. No, I don't have an idea. But it must. I mean, it's like half of the stars are binaries. No? So, so I'm sure it has it. It has it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a source of error. But uh, in fact, our stars cannot be less massive than 0.4 solar masses. So, I mean, these are just a first step in, into the yeah. comparisons. We are wanting to do simulations with higher resolution so that we can have the full spectrum of masses. In fact, if we have higher resolution, then we might start having multiples. So, but that's in the future, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I, still, I see that Enrique and Javier still have their, their hands up, but if there are no new questions, no, it no was I, I forgot to lower my hand. Jesus, sorry. <laughs> okay, well, uh, in that case, I think we can we can thank Alejandro again. Uh, so. <laughs> and yeah, that's it. Uh, see you. See you next week. Very good. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Alejandro. Thanks.